The air. Water. Earth. And sun. Awes us. The four awesome forces of nature can provide a thousand times more energy than we need. You are also awesome. You and me and all earth kind are the fifth element. We are literally changing the world. Technology is now harnessing nature's awesome power for electricity, heat, and transportation. And the best news is that the clean energy transition can save us money and create a more prosperous, just, beautiful, and sustainable civilization today. Welcome to the Awesome Earth Kind Podcast. And if you would, let folks know who you are, where do you live, and what kind of work do you do? I'm Brent Constance. Uh, I live out here on the San Francisco Peninsula in the hills behind Stanford University when I'm not out at the coast. And uh, I run Blue Planet, a uh, startup company here in Silicon Valley that captures CO2 and stores it in concrete. Amazing. Well, we're going to talk a lot about that in a moment. Uh, we'd like to start off with, uh, we call it a quantum quote, an inspirational quote that kind of helps frame the conversation and gives people an insight into your perspective. Yeah. Have one you care to share, Brent? The key to uh, mitigating CO2 and affecting climate change lies uh, in governments' abilities to use their procurement power to procure carbon sequestered materials at grand scales. And if we follow that mechanism, we could mitigate climate in a significant way, uh, billions of tons. Outstanding. And we'd like to have the first part just be why. Why do you do what you do, Brent? I do what I do to really make a difference uh, on what I think is this existential reality of having to deal with the climate. It, it goes beyond any other problems that we're dealing with today. And, and that's what I wake up in the morning to do every day. Outstanding. And so tell us about Blue Panda and what you guys do and how you do it. Well, you know, we've recognized that uh, we really need to, to somehow capture and store billions of tons of carbon dioxide. And so we pay a lot of attention to those numbers. You know, a billion tons, a gigaton is, uh, is a thousand million tons. And, and I, I don't think that's immediately obvious to everybody. You know, we, we know that humans... Uh, are putting out almost 40 billion tons, 40 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year. We know that. And, and all the climate modelers think we can put maybe another 500 gigatons into the atmosphere before things really get crazy. But, you know, that sounds like a lot, but it's not really a lot. It's, uh, you know, a little over 10 years. And, uh, when you talk about billions of tons, you have to think about it at scale. You know, there's a lot of excitement out there about, say, direct air capture and uh, plants that will do one million tons or one megaton. And you need a thousand of those to get to one gigaton. <laughs> you know, and um, we gotta, we've got to mitigate 40 gigatons. So, you know, that's 40,000 1 million ton plants, which is a lot. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's sort of like you and me, you know, when we hear the five o'clock news and they say the federal deficit is now a gazillion trillion dollars, it's, it's hard for us to relate to that, right? Right. It doesn't mean anything to us. You know, and if I'm in front of a senator talking to them, uh, you know, intelligent people, but they don't actually know the difference between a billion and a million. They don't really, you know, if someone says, I'm going to build a plant that's going to capture 10 million tons of CO2, most of them think, gee, that's going to save the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's, you know, it, it's actually 1% yeah. of one gigaton. You know, the state of California alone puts out about 500 million tons, half of a gigaton. And we're one of the largest economies in the world every year. And so mitigating a few million tons is certainly a lot laudable objective, 
but it's it's way too little, way too late to even show up beyond the noise of what we're doing. And I think I think that's the kind of precision and thought that needs to go into the sort of planning and thoughtful consideration of how we're really going to address this. So how do how does Blue Planet and uh, carbon capture with cement how does that impact things? Well, um, so when we look at concrete, concrete is the most uh, used material other than water in the world. It's the most marketed material, and concrete is about seventy or eighty percent aggregate, meaning sand and gravel. And there's about fifty gigatons of sand and gravel mined and transported and incorporated in asphalt and road base, but primarily in concrete every year. Wow. So we have an existing uh, market for rock and sand uh, that has all the logistics in place, all the economics in place, all the offtake and use in place already today. And it's not that it's concrete, it's that it's one of the few places we could actually store that much CO2. Mm. It turns out that um, the, the most common type of rock, about 70% of it that's mined and transported and moved is limestone, like the Great White, great, the white Cliffs of Dover, for example. And uh, there are reasons for that. It's softer, it's easier to mine, it's more compatible with the pH of concrete, all kinds of things. But the point is, of that largest market other than water in the world, all the aggregate, the lion's share of it is limestone. And what's different about limestone from other rocks is limestone is really made up of CO2 and calcium. It's calcium carbonate. So. CO2 diffuses into the ocean. It ends up in the skeleton of a marine organism that has a calcium carbonate skeleton, and it ends up lithifying and becoming limestone. So if I have a, a ton of limestone, I've got 440 kilograms of CO2 that's actually permanently crystallized in place in that limestone as carbonate. As, and, uh, so it provides this massive reservoir. If you figure 50 billion tons, 50 gigatons of rock for which there's a market today, it's being paid for, it's being transported, it's being used. 44% uh, of the mass of limestone is CO2. So that's something like 22 gigatons of CO2, 22 billion tons of CO2 in today's rock market that could be sequestered and really deal with almost the whole problem in a significant way. And the, the market for rocks growing tremendously. So, okay, so let me get this straight. So basically the world needs to eliminate, capture 40 gigatons worth of carbon. Right now we've got 50 gigatons worth of concrete that we're making of which about 22 gigatons is made up of carbon from existing creatures in the past. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna swap out the 22 tons of carbon from, uh, from the old creatures and limestone and such and put in new products that basically take CO2 out of the atmosphere? Is that the idea? Yeah, the idea is we capture the CO2, we mitigate the CO2 that otherwise would have entered the atmosphere uh, by capturing it and mineralizing it the same way organisms do. You know, mm -hmm. it's a mechanism called biomineralization, but we're we're doing it in an industrial way. Uh, same, same thing though, we're forming calcium carbonate solids, which will replace the mined sand and gravel in regular concrete. And we are, you know, you can't go into an existing market without affecting somebody, but who you're affecting are dredging of sand, you know, which has its own environmental issues or open pit mining of rock, which certainly has its environmental issues, but also, um, Typically, you know, dredging of sand and mining of rock is done in remote locations and requires a lot of transport of heavy materials into where it's used. And there's, you know, carbon footprint associated with the transportation of those heavy materials. So if you can make your rock right in the urban centers where there are CO2 emitters like power plants or cement plants or steel mills, what we're finding is a lot of the 
emitters of CO2, the major emitters are clustered together in industrial centers, usually at ports because of the transportation. So it's possible the world's already set up that way, if you will. There are, are these big ports where there are clusters of CO2 emitters where you can go and capture the CO2 from several emitters, use the Blue Planet process to make it into sand and gravel, limestone, sand and gravel, and distribute it the same way you would have distributed uh, geologically mined sand and gravel. The thing about mineralization of CO2 is that it's permanent. You know, a lot of the ways we're trying to mitigate CO2 are very laudatory in nature, but they're not permanent. You know, um, if I grow a tree, it's going to capture a lot of CO2 while it's growing, but then it's going to die and decay and put that CO2 back in the atmosphere. Or if I till it into the soil with roots, same, same sort of thing. Uh, if I use it for enhanced oil recovery, which is very popular these days, uh, when that oil comes out, the CO2 comes back out too. You know, so mineralization into rock is, is really the most permanent form of sequestration of CO2, which is what we need because we don't want it to come back out when our grandchildren are around. You know, that's not going to help the world very much. Yeah. And so, okay, so how, how do you capture it? I mean, how do you capture the CO2? And how do you, what's this process that uh, sounds incredible? So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. One fundamental thing that's different about what we do from everybody else in the CO2 world is we don't uh, at any time attempt to purify it so that it can be compressed and liquefied because we don't need to. We're, we're following nature's process, which is the diffusion of CO2 into a liquid. So for example, at our plant here in Pittsburgh, California, in the North Bay area near San Francisco, we... Uh, have what are called absorbers. These are gas liquid contactors. And we contact raw flue gas from a power plant with a, an ammonia-based absorption solution that captures the CO2 and turns it into carbonate, which is just what it sounds like. You know, you hear carbonated water. That's what we do. We turn it right into carbonate, similar to the ocean. The ocean is buffered by bicarbonate, for example. And then we have a calcium source, which at our plant in San Francisco is derived from old concrete or return concrete, which is the concrete that comes back uh, from a job that didn't get used on the job, which is five to 10% of all concrete. It's full of calcium and oxides, which we need. And we use that, we interact it with the solution we use to make the calcium carbonate. And it dissolves out the calcium and it refreshes the solution so it can capture more carbon dioxide. And uh, with that calcium and the carbonate solution, we form calcium carbonate and we have a way to do it. So it's not just a fine precipitate, but we actually form it into rocks, hard rocks, like a, like a marble hardness of limestone, uh, which is very useful as sand and gravel. And remember the marketed product is concrete. And concrete consists of about 10 to 15% cement, which is made at cement plants. But the other 70 to 80% is sand and gravel and water. And that's what we're providing. And what it provides is a way to store a whole bunch of CO2 in the, the built environment in the form of concrete, which is the most used building material in the world. And it has this interesting effect on the built environment you probably are aware of green building in the interest today in lowering the carbon footprint of buildings, meaning over the last several decades, we've done a really good job uh, increasing the energy efficiency of buildings and lowering the carbon, the operational carbon, if you will, of buildings through heating, air conditioning, all this kind of stuff. And so now the focus in the built environment world it's more about the embodied carbon in the building materials that are, is created on day one of the structure rather than the operational history. And so for example, at San Francisco International Airport, Blue Planet did our first pour, major pour in Terminal 1 there <laughs> with concrete in 2015. And uh, now the San Francisco Airport, which is a department in the city and county of San Francisco, has a five-year plan, which includes specification of concrete because they're pouring millions of tons of concrete up there. Um, 
that actually specifies that the concrete have a certain carbon embodied carbon footprint. And there's actually a rating system called the Carbon Star Rating, which gives a quantitative assessment of, uh, of the carbon footprint, or we call it the embodied carbon in, in a building material. So for example, up at SFO, uh, their five-year plan um, calls out, I think, a carbon star rating of 200 pounds per cubic yard of concrete. A regular yard of concrete has a carbon footprint of about 600 pounds. So they're asking for concrete with a low carbon footprint. And, the, and they have an exceptional a stretch goal of zero uh, CO2 per cubic yard and an exceptional goal of minus 200 per yard, meaning it's net sequestering 200. Now, normally in a building, the concrete is the 900 pound gorilla and the carbon footprint. This turns that on its head. It, the concrete becomes where you're actually sequestering carbon dioxide by using concrete that has aggregate that's made from carbon dioxide. And you're sequestering it in the concrete forever. So it's a new concept and it's a, a, it's a way to think differently, especially for the structural engineers. The engineers have, are taught today that you wanna minimize the amount of concrete because it has such a, a large carbon footprint, which actually comes from the Portland cement, which is only 10 to 15% of it. Uh, now, if you're net sequestering CO2 in concrete, then you wanna use as much concrete as you can. <laughs> <laughs> because it makes the whole building more carbon negative, right? Right. And yeah. they're sequestering more CO2. And, and that leads to all kinds of interesting things. You know, um, you know, before steel existed and steel beams, you had to use wood and concrete. Uh, and wood had its limitations. Um, so, you know, if you go back to the pyramids, you see whole structures that are built out of basically concrete. A lot of people don't know that like the Giza pyramid in Egypt is concrete. It's not big blocks of limestone. But anyway, the, the point is when you build a structure like that, it can be very strong in compression. And concrete is only strong in compression. It's weak in tension, torsion, and flexure. Steel is strong in tension, torsion, and flexure. So that's that's sort of the evolution of the structure of the built environment today. Hmm. But if all of a sudden you're thinking of concrete differently, you're thinking, gee, it's really strong in compression. Maybe I'm going to make my wall thicker and do some other things. I'm going to use less steel. Uh, my, my buildings start looking different. Uh, and, and the whole way I look at the built environment as a place to store carbon becomes quite different. You know, uh, here in California, we're putting in uh, a high speed rail system. And the reason for the high-speed rail system is to lower emissions by mass, using mass transit. Uh -huh. uh, but it's also going to be 560 miles of concrete, which have a tremendous carbon footprint that uh, are, are significant enough that they actually offset a lot of the savings from the mass transportation. Wow. But that whole tr project can be transformed by the concrete becoming either carbon neutral or carbon negative and become a major place to sequester a lot of CO2. And it's all paid for by the same dollars that we're going to pay for the concrete in the first place. So it's not dependent on a carbon price or a subsidy or a fine or a tax or anything like that. It's the same dollars. And, and that's really important because, you know, we all are in favor of carbon legislation and we know that, but the fact is we have to be sober about the fact that most countries are never going to have a carbon price. Like 95% of the countries in the world are never going to have a carbon system like the US, what you see in Europe, Japan, Norway, places like that. It's never going to exist. And so a lot of the, the ways to remove CO2 that we're looking at are dependent on some sort of government subsidy. But they're not going to have one in Indonesia. <laughs> Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. It's a major CO2 emitter. Neither is India. And so you need solutions that work in poor countries as well as rich countries. You know, and 
um, that's what's great is India is going to build roads. Indonesia is going to build roads. China is going to build roads. They're going to pay for the rock. They don't need a subsidy. They're not going to have one because if, if they make their rock out of CO2, all it means is you're taking rock from a CO2 emission source instead of mining it out of the ground. Cool. So, all right. So it makes so much sense, obviously, um, to capture the carbon, put it into cement. We've got enough cement that we're using to basically take care of all the issues. If we just put all our carbon into the cement, what's the big challenges that are out there and what's the solutions to overcome them? Well, you know, we're talking uh, one of the largest uh, mass material movements in the history of the planet. You know, like I was saying, there's even today, there's over 50 billion tons of rock mined and moved around. So it's, it's not a, a small feat to step into that. On the other side, it provides this massive infrastructure that we can step into. I'll give you an example. At the plant we're building up in, uh, in Pittsburgh uh, now, um, there's a large bulk processing facility that's uh, only operating at 10% capacity on the deep water port where our plant is. And there's an ability to step right into that existing infrastructure. Now this facility can move about 10 million tons of rock a year in a, in a region that uh, consumes about 10 million tons of rock. And so it's this really broad, massive logistical aspect of capturing this much CO2. You know, a typical uh, natural gas fired power plant might put out one to 2 million tons of CO2 a year. Coal plant might put out, depending on its size, five to 10 million tons of CO2. A really big refinery might put out 10 million tons. An average cement plant, maybe a million tons. Now for every ton of CO2, because 44% of the mass of limestone is CO2, we can make about two and a half tons of rock. So if someone gives us a million tons of CO2, we can make two and a half million tons of saleable rock that we have to get out to the concrete plants. And so it, that's one aspect of what we're doing is it's far and away without any question at all one of the fastest major permanent solutions for CO2 sequestration. You know, you're probably aware most of the world's looking at geologic sequestration of purified CO2. Um, and, and that's great if it works, but you know, it involves building a, a CO2 pipeline infrastructure, getting permits for you know, injecting CO2 underground, monitoring it, ensuring it. And it's, it's, there, there are many limitations that put any significant implementation of geologic sequestration, you know, decades away. Um, you know, when we did the San Francisco airport work, uh, the, uh, the truck from Central Concrete, our local U.S. concrete affiliate, just stopped by, picked up the rock, took it up to the ready mix plant and poured the concrete. You know, and, and, and that's how it is all over the world, right? That's how concrete is made. You have these, they're called ready mix plants. From wh That's where concrete is delivered from. You know, what we call a cement truck, that's a concrete truck. <laughs> so it's delivering concrete, you know, which is the marketed product. So are you saying then that you can capture it, put it in the cement at the same price that you can mine it and put it into cement anyway, make it into concrete anyway? Yeah, so... Um, you know, that's a, a really good point. In almost every case, uh, we're a, a lower price option. And the reason is, is that it uh, turns out most of the price of rock, of sand and gravel, is not what it costs to mine it. It's the, it's the cost to transport it because it's really heavy and there's large quantities of it. So, you know, the, in fact, the, the price to actually mine it and wash it and sort it and all that is, is almost, not always, it depends what the travel distance is, but usually almost in the noise. And so even though we have to you know, process it and form rock and all that kind of stuff versus just digging it out of the ground and sorting it and washing it, um, since the lion's share of the price is really the transport, usually CO2 emission sites 
are located where there's good transportation close in to urban centers. You know, I mean, look at Long Beach, California. That's one of the biggest ports in the world. You know, it's got rock being delivered there, rock being transported there. It's got all these CO2 emitters, some from very hard to abate CO2 emission type of industries. And you're right near downtown LA. <laughs> <laughs> so Mayor Garcetti is so excited about the Olympics coming there and he wants to have the greenest Olympics ever like they always do. And, you know, he has the ability working through the port of Long Beach with Blue Planet to make the whole Olympics carbon negative. Wow. <laughs> no one's ever done before. Yeah. You know, so it, it opens up a lot of possibilities. So, okay, so you've got this tremendous opportunity to capture carbon, take it out of the environment, put it into, into cement concrete and offset all these emissions and it's a cheaper solution. What's stopping it from happening? Well, it's just uh, a matter of getting it out there. The strategy we're taking is um, going with large industrial emitters who have fleets of many, many large emission sites. So for example, uh, if you look at some of the press about the company, uh, we did a large partnership with Mitsubishi Corporation uh, about a year ago. And uh, uh, they're organizing uh, hundreds of sites in Asia to do Blue Planet right now. Wow. And uh, they have uh, not not just in Japan. I'm talking about all of Asia. They have uh, long-term relationships and developments with hundreds of plants. We uh, will announce in a month or two. We signed a partnership with one of the largest cement companies because. Not only can we make concrete carbon negative, but we can actually go to their cement kilns as well and capture the CO2 at the cement kiln so that the cement itself doesn't have a big carbon footprint anymore. We, uh, you probably, you may have noticed in the press that Chevron uh, is, has made a big commitment to CO2 abatement. I mean, it's a real change in behavior from the oil industry. They've mm -hmm. really stepped out, put, and, you know, even if it's not even their emissions, you know, uh, you know, I, I know for the low carbon fuel standard in California, they're one of the largest payers into that fund, you know, wow. for that. Um, and, uh, and they have refineries around the world that, uh, you know, use it with, with, and they're very interested in mitigating the CO2 at, at those sites. Um, so we're, so we're forming just, several- Just a matter of logistics? Uh, well, you know, it's always different. So, you know, with this large cement company that we've done uh, this partnership with, they pretty much know what to do with rock, you know, because a lot of the cement companies are vertically integrated. So they're not only are they producing cement, which goes to the concrete ready mix plants, but they also own quarries to send sand and gravel to the concrete plants, you know, uh -huh. and, and so th they pretty much know what to do. But if you go to say, uh, you know, say an oil company, they haven't the vaguest idea what to do with rock. You know, uh -huh. yeah, why yeah. should they? <laughs> so, with them, we have to bring uh, distributors together of you know, rock. For example, one of our partners, Knife River, uh, is I think they're about the eighth largest aggregate producer. Um, you know, they they have uh, interests in being part of these uh, hubs where Blue Planet systems are operating. You know, so you have both the offtaker of the rock and the emitter of the CO2, and you got to bring them together. And, you know, in the evolution of Blue Planet, originally we were more focused on the emitter and capturing the CO2, and then secondarily looking at the rock market. And as we've got into these commercial schemes that we're developing all over the world with our partners today. Uh, we're actually tending to focus more on the offtaker of the rock and the local need for a rock, you know, given the transportation limitations and things like that. And then secondarily looking for the CO2, because what we find is there's CO2 everywhere and there's, everyone wants to mitigate it. And, uh, 
and some of the logistical aspects are, um, you know, you don't want to go build a whole blue planet plant somewhere if you're not going to have a bomb proof, consistent supply of CO2. So for example, here in California, uh, we only turn on the natural gas plants when it's not sunny. Right? Uh -huh. uh, we're, we're, we, when it's sunny, we curtail a lot of the power. Right. You know? Yeah, sure. Because you, you, you have so much solar. It's great. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but when it's dark, you know, or cloudy or, you know, it's so hot, everyone turns on their air conditioner, which most Californians don't have, at least in Northern California anyway, um, you know, then they turn on the natural gas plant. So they have very low capacity factors, you know, mm -hmm. like 20%, 30%, 40%. So it'd be hard to justify, you know, building a whole blue planet system just for that low capacity factor. But if you have several emitters clustered together, which is how they're usually laid out anyway, all around the world at ports, uh, then, you know, sunny day, the natural gas plant shuts down. Well, that's okay. A hard to bait emitter like a, a, a steel mill or a cement plant or a refinery or, you know, potentially right there. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's the kind of logistical thinking. We, we have groups at MIT and Zaragoza University that just specialize in logistical planning of this sort of thing. Uh, we also have really interesting options. We don't have to put the whole plant right at the emission site. We only have to put the part where you absorb the CO2. Right. The other part can, can be remote where you can pile up big piles of rocks. Incredible, cool. Well, I'd like to ask if um, there's maybe one kind of big idea, one we call a value supernova of uh, something that people should know, but most folks don't. Um, you need a tool, a tip, but they're a tactic. Uh, you got anything that you think that most people should be aware of? I know you're a couple, yeah. a couple but go ahead. I, you know, when I'm teaching, I like to ask the students, where do you think all the carbon is anyway? Where do you think the carbon is? Where do I think the carbon is? Where? Hmm. Yeah. Where? Great point. Um, well, you know, some would say it's in uh, in the earth where it's been stored for billions of years. I guess that would be my guess. Um, fossil fuels being a key component of it that we keep emitting. But um, then there's under the permafrost and everywhere else. But am I mistaken? Go ahead, Professor. <laughs> well, OK, so back to the quantitative part. Um, so when we talk about carbon as opposed to carbon dioxide, so we can be inclusive of hydrocarbons and things uh -huh. like that, um, there's about 750 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay. You know, and the atmosphere is just like an 85,000 foot thick envelope of gas around the earth. You know, it's right. not that thick. Yeah. Um, and um, in the whole biosphere, all the rainforests, all the plankton in the ocean, all that, uh, there's about 5,000 gigatons. Okay. So 750 in the atmosphere, 5,000 in the biosphere. Uh -huh. Right. And then in the hydrosphere, all the lakes, rivers, oceans, ice caps, uh, there's about 38 to 40,000 gigatons. Okay. Of carbon. That's in all the waters. Okay. In the hydrosphere. Yeah. Go ahead. And then in the lithosphere, which you said, you know, the earth, uh, there's about 55 million gigatons. There you go. I got it right. <laughs> and, and 55 million gigatons in the earth, eh? So, right. Okay. And, and it turns out most of it is actually as limestone. Wow. Really? And, and almost wow. all limestone is the skeletal remains of marine organisms like corals and, you know, coccolithophorids, which make up the white cliffs of Dover and, uh, you know, the Great Barrier Reef, things like that. That's where all the limestone is. And it becomes about 10% of the crust of the earth is limestone. And, wow. um, and so, you know, the proposal to put the carbon and store it in limestone is not so novel an idea. <laughs> it's the most common pathway for all of Earth's carbon already. Uh -huh. And then the uh, the fossil fuels, so basically all those dead living things uh, that have built up over the years that we've been burning in oil and gas and everything else. Um, you know, that's really our main source of carbon dioxide at this point, right? And greenhouse gases. Or? 
Yeah, that, that's right. We're, uh, we're combusting all these hydrocarbons and sending the CO2 into the atmosphere. And, and most of it uh, has, you know, since the industrial age began, has been absorbed into the oceans. Not most, but a lot of it has been absorbed into the oceans. And it depends how you model it. But, um, you know, it, uh, we, we've, we don't feel there's, you know, many decades more where the oceans will continue to absorb significant amounts. I think that's the main message is that uh, you know, this oceans have given us a buffer for a while and um, things are going to change when the oceans can't absorb that CO2. But we are seeing interesting things happen, you know, in the history of the earth, like about 100 million years ago in the Cretaceous, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere were much, much higher than they were today like seven times higher. You know, we talk about 400 parts per million today. In the Cretaceous, we know from a variety of techniques, you know, it was over 2,500 parts per million. Of course, there were no ice caps. Sea level was a lot higher. There are crocodiles in the North Pole, things like that. But um, what we're seeing is uh, as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, the amount of carbonate formed in the ocean is increasing. And, uh, and, you know, we're seeing really uh, interesting things that are mimicking geologic episodes in the past. And what does that mean? It's, it's hard to interpret. Um, you know, the largest massive limestone deposits in the world were all formed when CO2 is high. Uh, huh. So in terms of humanity and the impact on our civilization, what's your projection then, Professor? I think we're going to weather this. And I, I think that uh, I think the key is in the largest commodity out there, which is concrete. I think it's really important that people think about things quantitatively when we make policies and decide what we're going to do. I think it's really easy to miss the forest for the trees and uh, do really cool things uh, thinking that they're going to impact climate change. But until you actually look at the numbers and, uh, you know, really see what impact they're going to have, you don't really know. Okay. But I, I would imagine that you do think it's a good idea to re produce less carbon through a transition to clean energy. Absolutely. For a number okay. of reasons, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can make, uh, you can make nylon out of hydrocarbons. You don't have to burn them. <laughs> there you go. And what could be more elegant than solar energy? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's the uh, largest power source around, right? So, all yeah. right. Well, we're going to uh, enter what we call the pulsar round, or we're going to answer a series of questions and we're looking for your short, succinct, amazing and mind blowing answers. Are you ready, sir? Yes. There we go. What's the best advice you've ever received? Be patient. Ooh, a good one. Patience. All right. Uh, if you would share one of your personal habits that contributes to your success. I spend uh, at least an hour every morning thinking. Sitting back and thinking first thing, huh? Usually in the hot tub. In the hot tub, even better. With a good cup of coffee. Ooh, really great way to get some perspective, eh? All right. Would you have an internet resource that you uh, think folks should know about, care to share? Uh, go to carbonstar.org. Carbonstar.org. All right. And a book you think folks might be interested in? Um, I think uh, The Origin of the Species by... Charles Darwin. Origin of the Species by Charles Darwin. Very fascinating book. So is it your perspective that it is the uh, survival of the fittest or is it really cooperation that has made civilization be who we are? Coevolution. Coevolution. There we go. Fascinating. All right. If you had a magic wand and you can wave it and change one thing for everybody in the world, what would it be? Uh, I think uh, it would be education. Yeah, key, right? Absolutely. 
education for everybody. Wonderful. Well, coming on the uh, the last parts of our interview here, and uh, I'd like to ask you, what's the one thing you're most energized about today, Brent? Blue Planet. Blue Planet. There we go. Love it. And uh, in terms of your next steps, what's your next steps with Blue Planet? Go global. Go global. Outstanding. And if you have a piece of parting advice for folks and the best way to, for them to get a hold of you, if you'd like them to. Uh, contact us through Blue Planet. I think it's uh, info at blueplanetsystems.com. Uh, Blueplanetsystems.com. Blue Planet okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, be happy to interface with anybody. Sounds great. Anything that you wanted to cover that we missed? Yeah, I think people should recognize new legislations like the Buy Clean legislation in California and support that kind of uh, policy in their venue uh, to get governments to use procurement to mitigate uh, CO2 removal, which they can do. Excellent and outstanding advice. And one of the things we've been promoting for a bit, but just to reiterate folks, is every time you pick up the phone, you write a letter, you contact your elected official, they view that as the perspective of a thousand other people because you've taken the time, effort, and energy to make your voice heard. And they interpret that as being the voice of a thousand others in your community. So Brent, thank you very much for that piece of wisdom and advice. And I uh, really appreciate you being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for including me. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today, awesome Earthkind people. Do you want to increase your climate impact by a factor of 1,000? Then pick up your phone today and call your United States congressional representative and both your U.S. senators and ask them to support the federal Build Back Better bill. Build Back Better will create the largest climate protection action in American history. Because so few people take the time and make the effort, our elected representatives interpret the opinion of everyone who calls or writes as representing the views of 1,000 other citizens. Congress will vote on the Build Back Better bill that aims to get our country to 80% pollution-free electricity by 2030 and cut climate pollution 100% by 2050. The Build Back Better bill provides tax incentives for solar, wind, energy efficiency, electric cars, charging stations, and more. And it will finally cut the subsidies for fossil fuels. It will also drive major investments into communities that have been disproportionately hit by environmental injustice. When you make the calls, spread the word via social media by posting images of a large red exclamation point using the hashtags Code Red Climate and Code Red Congress. You'll be joining some of your favorite musicians and celebrities, including the Dave Matthews Band, Dead End Companies, Billie Eilish, Melissa Eldridge, Phineas, Maroon 5, Brittany Howard, John Baptiste, Alex Benjamin, Leonardo DiCaprio, Jane Fonda, Mark Ruffalo, Damon and Stephen Marley, Group Love, Huey Lewis and the News, and many more. When the Build Back Better bill passes, the United States can enter the global climate negotiations on November 1st, with America setting out to cut climate pollution 100% by 2050 and be able to encourage other nations to do the same. If not you, then who? The time is now. Act now, pick up the phone, call your congressional representatives and US senators and help create a better future for our children and all the 7 billion Earthkind people on the planet. Thank you.